Darius Britt here. So part of our job as filmmakers is to have a command of the visual medium so that we can tell the stories that we want to tell, right? Right. This means knowing where to put the camera in any given scenario in order to capture the emotion of the scene or the moment. It seems like a simple enough task until you go out and shoot something. Oh, one more time, Mike. Something as simple as shooting a close-up can become confusing when you realize just how many different ways you can shoot it. Should I get a profile, a below eye level, above eye level, frontal, classic, wh which is the best way to do it? Disclaimer. How you choose to compose your close-ups depends on your story, depends on your own personal taste. There are no rules, just tools. Cool, so that's out of the way. I shot a small scene using four different close-up shots. Let's see how the different angles might affect the scene. Let's get into it. Is that it? Yeah. So this first angle is the classic close-up. We see a lot of the talent's face. It's all about hugging that eye line with the camera so that we can see as much of those eyes as possible. So you're the actor, this is where you're looking and this is camera. I'm gonna try to move camera as close to where you're looking as I can so that I can see as much of your face as possible. This is what I would call a safe choice. If you frame it up nicely, you can't really go wrong with this angle, but don't get me wrong, nine times out of 10, this will work for you, definitely. But sometimes it's just not the most interesting choice. Moving on to version two. Is that it? Yeah. In this version, we used a low profile close-up. By low, I mean below eye level. And by profile, we're seeing the side of your talent's face. Typically, you'd use profile shots like this to indicate some sort of like showdown or face-off. Of course, that's not the only use, it's just the most effective way I've seen them used. I've used them in the same way and it works. If you've got two characters staring each other down and you shoot them in a profile, it looks like they're facing off against each other. Sometimes I might use a profile shot just to like mix things up a little bit because you don't want every close-up to be all up in your actor's face. It gets a little redundant, you feel me? In this case, I don't think a low profile is doing very much for us. I don't care for the composition, but it's an option. Moving on, sponsor. Just so you cats know, this video is sponsored by Artlist. The music you're hearing in this little scene deal is from Artlist. Most of the music I've been using over the past couple years from Artlist. They do offer a great service, and yes, I dig it. They update their music catalog on a daily basis. If you're looking for music for your films or videos, they have a ton. You won't have a problem finding something that fits your vibe. With an Artlist subscription, you get unlimited downloads for an entire year. And if you sign up with Artlist using the link below, you will get two extra months free with your subscription. Hashtag booyah. And we are back to the lecture at hand, boys and girls, moving on. Is that it? Yeah. So this is what we call short sighting. As you can see, I have removed the look space from the composition. The actor is looking right at the edge of frame. We see more behind the actor than we do in front of them. Typically you'd see this framing used to communicate just discomfort, awkwardness, just a general like trapped feeling. I mean, as an audience member, just looking at that framing makes me feel uncomfortable. This framing isn't used very often because it draws attention to itself. Like in my experience, it's most effective when it's used sparingly, like a little goes a long way. Whatever she's writing, if we're about some life-changing incident, I might use this shot to communicate that her back is against the wall. She has to open up and say something. So that's short sighting, moving on. Is that it? Yeah.
we are using central framing in this shot. We are not on either side of the eye line. We are right in front of the actor. You can do this above eye level, below eye level, at eye level, totally up to you in whatever the scene calls for. I shot this handheld, definitely shakier than I would have liked, but I wanted to include this version for a reference. Sometimes when you hunt for the shot, you end up with shots like this. We're only seeing her eyes. When I found this, I had to include it. It's visually interesting, but above all else, it makes me feel something when I look at it. Seeing it all cut together, I might only use this shot if I was gonna cut to it once. I wouldn't I wouldn't cut back to it. Uses, you might use central framing in a close-up if you want your actors to address camera directly. Kind of like what I'm doing right now. Also, if you've got a scene with three actors, you might cover one of the actors dead center of frame, looking back and forth between the other two actors. You can do that without breaking the fourth wall. Using a close-up like this, you know, it, it's more of a stylistic choice. So if it works, it works because it matches the style that you're using to to tell the story, but the style needs to be consistent. And for our last close up. Is that it? Yeah. Ain't no close up. Boo! Surprise, surprise. I included this because sometimes you might think that you need a close up for emotional impact only to find out you really don't. It's happened to me a number of times. Sometimes you'll just kind of get a gut feeling that you don't need it. Wide shots can be just as impactful as a close up. Like you don't always have to be all up in your actor's face to capture the emotion. You can always shoot a close up anyways, right? Like just for safety, just to have it in case you need it. But odds are in those scenarios, your, your gut feeling might be right. You probably, you know, you probably don't need it. Think of that argument seen in Sicario. You still get the idea through the body language, the voice. It works so much better as a wide shot. As a rule of thumb, if I personally feel like I'm close enough to the actor to see their facial expressions, or if there's enough body language going on, I might consider losing the close up altogether. But again, it's a case by case basis. This is why there are no close ups at the end of Unsound. In this scene, the story is all in the blocking, in the body language. We just need to see these two characters together in that same space, in the same frame. That says way more than any close up ever could. So, which close up did you like best in our little sample scene? Again, what really matters is how these shots make you feel. What may work for another filmmaker might not work for you. We each have our own taste, we have our own style. That's what makes us all different. My picks. Now this isn't a complete story, just a made up scene. I like the classic close up and short sighting. If those two were appropriate for the larger story, I'd probably go with those. But if this were an actual film and I'd already shot like a ton of close ups in it, then I might let it ride in a wide, you know, just take a break from all the intensity, get out of my actor's face for a minute. Remember the best teacher is experience. You'll learn more from experience than any YouTube video. So if you're having trouble with your framing and composition and whatnot, just shoot really small projects and like work your way up, you will be surprised at how far that will take you. If you're new to filmmaking, you might want to check out this other video I did on things that new filmmakers overlook. Framing choices, composition choices that have a bigger impact, but often don't get as much attention as they deserve. But thank you for watching. Keep pulsing and deep bridge out.